Hey YouTube, today we're going to talk about the differences between word and sentence embeddings and how large language models use word embeddings plus positional encoding to better understand natural language. Now I want to apologize for the delay in this video. My CPU burned out and I had to replace my editing PC. But to make up for it, tomorrow we're going to have a larger discussion on how to create your own training corpi and a more in-depth discussion on how to use LoRa's for fine-tuning. And if you'd like to skip ahead to where we use Instructor XL and BERT to create word and sentence embeddings, you can skip to the chapter below. But if you'd like to stay tuned to learn more about how large language models use word embeddings and positional encoding, please stay tuned. So let's get started. So the attention layer is multifaceted with four very important jobs. The first being to determine the importance of each word in context with the other words in the sentence and to ascribe importance to each of those words. Secondly, to provide a way for the model to focus on different parts of the input. So for example, if you or I are giving or are given commands, we want to be able to focus on the correct parts of those statements so we understand the commands that were given or are being given. Next, it needs to be able to handle inputs of varying lengths. So it needs to be able to handle one, a hundred or 10,000 or more tokens while having the models uh, remain performant and stable. And finally, it needs to be able to maintain relationships between words such as nouns and pronouns, regardless of the distance between those words. So this is done through several steps. First, we need to be able to generate our word embeddings from our input, and we'll go over how that's done in just a moment. And then we need to be able to append positional encodings to those embeddings, and we'll also cover how that's done. And finally, add those together before sending them off to the multi-head attention layer where we're going to generate our query key and value sets. So now let's move on to how embeddings are generated. So there are really two different types of embeddings when we're talking about text. There's word embeddings and there are sentence embeddings, and they are used very differently by models and by people. So word embeddings are what are typically used by large language models to do the completion process while sentence embeddings are what we typically use to create vector databases and to do searches. So let's talk about how each of them works and what they do. So in word embeddings, we take each word and we create a vector, which is a numeric representation of that word. So for example, if we have a model whose size is six, we're going to have each of these embedding vectors be of size six. So if we take the sentence, the dog jumped over the cat, we're going to end up with six vectors of length six. So for example, the could be 0 0.3726, 0 0.9237, and so forth, representing where that word the is in our embedding space. And the same for dog and jumped and over and the and so forth. But this ultimately results in an embedding matrix which will then be added to our positional encoding and used later in the large language model. But with sentence embeddings, instead of converting each individual word to a numeric vector, we're converting the entire sentence. So for example, if we look again at the sentence, the dog jumped over the cat, and again, we assume a smaller model size for simplicity of six, the dog jumped over the cat could be mapped to 0 0.4131, 0 0.2984, and so forth. And then we can compare it to other uh, sentence embeddings and find sentences that are similar to this sentence. And there are multiple models that do this. So OpenAI has ADA, which has a dimension of 1,536, but there are also a lot of open source options, and there will be more in the description below. But the most common one is Instructor XL, which has 768 dimensions, followed by probably E5 large with 1,024 dimensions. And at the end of this video, we will go over both of these kind of embeddings and show their results. But now let's move on to how positional encoding works for word embeddings and how we compute them. So why positional encoding matters to language models is because we want the language model to understand the position of each token. And order does matter in languages. So if we look at the sentence, Eamon knows Alex versus Alex knows Eamon, we have two sentences with very similar concepts, but completely different meanings. So for our positional encoding for our large language models, we would like a few different criteria to be met. We would like the encoding for each position to be unique. We would like a consistent distance between each token, and preferably we would like those distances to be bound. 
And then we want to generalize to arbitrary token counts, and we would like it to be deterministic. And finally, we would like it to be directionally irreverent. And what that means is we don't want to favor left versus right or right versus left languages. So for example, Japanese versus English, where in Japanese we have a right to left language and in English we have a left to right language and we would like our model to learn those equally well. And why positional encoding helps is that indexes, for example, are not the best approach because first they're cumbersome. So now we're having to kind of lug around this uh, additional set of values, and it just doesn't generalize well. And it tends to lead to earlier or later tokens being over favored by the model. Uh, for example, if we have 10,000 input tokens and we're carrying indices, the first index could be 1.2, but the later one, so if we go all the way out to 10,000, it could be 10,014 or 10,001.4. And the model is going to end up favoring one of these tokens, and that's not a desired behavior. So that's where sine and cosine come in. Sine and cosine are bound between negative one and one. And for different coefficients inside of the sine or a cosine, we can ensure that each of these have a unique encoding. While there's no hard and fast rule on how to set up these sine or cosine functions, the important thing to see is that for any coefficient, they're unique and they're also bound between one and negative one, which means that we get two things. We get to tell the network what position the token it's looking at is in, and we're not overweighting each token, which gives us kind of the ideal scenario for training our network. So now let's move forward and look at an example of computing one of these. To start our positional encoding, we're gonna start with the word embedding example we used, the dog jumped over the cat which gave us the following word embedding matrix. And now we need to set up our sine and cosine functions, which can be arbitrary. But what was similar to the attention is all you need paper is sine of K, where K is the token that we're at. So for example, the would be our zeroth token and lines up with this row divided by an arbitrary integer N. In this case, I'm using 1000 raised to the two times i. And now this i is a little strange, so we're doing things in pairs. So for example, the zeroth i would be this column and this column from this row here. And so we do them as even odd pairs, where the first i in this case is a sine function and the odd is a cosine function, but they both have the same i. And you can see that if you look at the sine two divided by 1000 to the two sixth and cosine of two over 1000 raised to the two sixth. And then the same here for four sixth and then of course the one coefficient. And this is all divided by our model size D, which is the length of each of these vectors in the matrices. And then we end up with this value here. And all we have to do now is add them up element wise, where this element lines up with this element and this element lines up with this element. And this is the value we get. And that is all we have to do. And the large language model learns how to deal with things positionally and how to weight tokens as being important from this. So now let's move forward and use Instructor Excel and BERT to create word and sentence embeddings. So what we're going to be getting is a group of embeddings that allow us to gauge the similarity of things. But I've heard some confusion about what embeddings we will get from certain things. So word embeddings are per word. So for example, may I have an embedding? This will be tokenized, and in this case, it should break out into about 10 tokens, and each of those tokens are going to get an embedding. But in sentence embedding, we're going to be able to submit a chunk of text, and that will be embedded. So typically, the word embedding is used by large language models to be able to learn language, while sentence or text embedding is used for us to be able to create search functions and uh, gauge the similarity of documents. So I wanted, I thought it was important to create that distinction so we better understand what we're using. But now let's, let's go ahead and create some word and sentence embeddings. Now for this sentence embedding, I'm going to be using a BERT uh, 
language model, and that is going to create my word embeddings. So let's go ahead and run this and see how it works. So if I go ahead and run it, it takes just a few moments to run and it's going to break it a few at a couple of places that I've asked it to. And in this case, we do indeed get 10 tokens. And these tokens are going to be sent into the hidden layer of my model. And that is going to actually create uh, my embeddings for me. So let's go ahead and run that. And now we get the embeddings. And so now we have 10 768 dimensional vectors. And each of those vectors tell me where am I in embedding space? And now if I go ahead and return this and ask it to get me the embedding for the word have, I get one 768 dimensional vector. And if I go ahead and let that print, this is what I get. But now I can run sentence embedding and that will let me embed an entire chunk of text for comparison with another chunk of text. So in this case, we're using Instructor XL and Instructor XL is probably the best performing embedding system and it allows me to embed various different kinds of documents. So let me go ahead and run this and see what we get. So in this case, we have the sentence 3D action slam wearable person tracking in multi-floor environments. And my instruction is a cool movie title. Perhaps not the most relevant thing, but uh, would allow me to edit this and see what other things more similar. So now if I ask it for a sci-fi movie title, and let's look at the embedding vector here and remember these positions, we should be able to get something similar, but it will have moved. So let's go ahead and put in a sci-fi movie title and go ahead and hit play again. And now instead of having exactly where that embedding was, it should shift a little bit. And that is the power behind this. We can compare things spatially, whether they're words or they're chunks of text. And in the case of word embeddings, that's how our large language model learns how things are related. And for us with chunk or text in, uh, embedding, we can use that for search functions and other similarity scores. And if we look at this vector, it is indeed pretty close. So if we were to do some kind of Euclidean distance between these two, we would find that they're very close as compared to something else where if we put in a totally new sentence, um, giraffe, uh, I like dinosaurs and I want to see a movie about them. If we run that now, the vector should completely change because now we're, while it's not the furthest thing in the world, it's no longer along that same line. So now our embedding should be very different and it is. So it's a tremendously different vector now. But again, we could come up with something that's even more different. So we could talk about oncology, for example, and that would be in a different part of space. But this is the power behind how embeddings let us create searches and allow language models to understand natural language. Now, if you'd like to try these out for yourself, I do have them in the description below. And that's really all there is to this. This is how we create word and, and sentence embeddings. And this, if we were to have a vector database, we could store these in there or some other store for later retrieval. And that's really it. That's all it takes for large language models to understand the importance and positionalities of tokens in your input text. So if this was helpful, please like and subscribe and please let us know in the comments below what you'd like to hear about next and tune in tomorrow for when we're going to go over how to use your own training corpus and more detailed instruction on how to do fine tuning with Laura's. See y'all next time.